the end of the presentation. However, you may choose to type your questions into the Q&A box located in the lower right corner of your screen, either at the end of the presentation, or you may submit your questions along the way during the presentation. For people calling into the meetings, into the meeting, we will provide instructions on how to ask your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. We also encourage you to submit your written comments to the online survey or to the email address that will be provided at the end of the presentation. We ask that you please do not use the chat box feature to comment or ask questions as someone on the phone may, uh, as someone may be joining us on the phone and we want to be able to ensure that everyone can equally participate and hear all the questions. The chat feature is enabled so that you can ask the host technical assistance only. I will now, I would now like to welcome Supervisor Gross from the Mason District to open up the meeting with brief remarks. Supervisor Gross. Yep, there we go. <laughs> I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, you are. Good, good evening. Good evening. Um, I guess we've all had a little bit of a problem logging in. Um, and I just wanted to make a few uh, brief remarks before uh, turning it over to staff. And then I'm going to um, get off of the um, a presentation because uh, I've already heard it, actually. And staff will uh, share the questions with me later. Transportation infrastructure was a significant issue as the Seven Corners Plan was adopted several years ago. Although future construction funding has not yet been identified, staff and a consultant have been studying the existing infrastructure and are ready to present their findings tonight, asking for feedback from the public before proceeding. This presentation will be re repeated tomorrow night in Spanish to accommodate the diverse population of the Seven Corners area. I hope you find tonight's presentation and discussion helpful, and I will turn it over to staff to continue telling you what they have found. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor Gross. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Mike Garcia, who will start our presentation. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Seven Corners Phasing Study presentation. Uh, tonight is the first of three public meetings that we plan to hold over the next year during the course of the study, with our second uh, round of public meetings being in the late in late summer, early fall, and our third round being in the winter of next year. Uh, the focus of tonight's meeting is to actually look at the travel conditions in the Seven Corners area. And we're going to look at typical travel conditions. And what we're going to show you tonight is pre pandemic conditions. So while we might refer to them as typical and, and existing, they are pre pandemic. Uh, so with that, I just want to move forward. Okay, let me try another way. All right, so what I'm going to do is quickly walk through our agenda and then I'll turn it over to Maggie, who will start our first uh, of the presentation. So tonight we are joined by the director of the Fairfax County Department of Transportation, uh, Tom Bashadney, myself, Michael Garcia. I am the chief of the transportation planning section. Maggie Chi, who you'll hear from next, will go over the first half of the presentation and she's the team lead for our modeling and corridors team. Tom Burke, who's moderating the discussion tonight, is the head of our long range planning team. Farouk Hazenajan, who's our um, host tonight, is actually going to be there for technical assistance. And we're also joined by Robin Geiger and Tanya McCurry from our marketing and communications outreach. And our consultant team is Kittleson Associates, joined by their team member, Inspire Green. So the purpose of tonight, uh, so we're going to go over a little bit about the background, kind of where we were from the plan amendment, where we are now and where we plan to go, um, kind of the purpose of the study. So why we're actually going through it, we're going to walk you through a little bit of the process that we're going to go through in terms of actually in conducting the study and gathering outreach. We'll go a little bit over about how we do it. We're not we're going to keep it high level so it doesn't go into too much detail. Um, if you would like the detail, I'm happy to share it with you if you like. Um, we're going to go over the typical traffic uh, traffic conditions. We're going to look at the vehicular conditions, the pedestrian conditions, transit conditions, and bicycle conditions. And then finally, we'll talk to you about next steps in our schedule. So our next steps, we have an in, we have our future years that we're going to look at, uh, which will help us determine the phasing of the order of improvements. We're also going to talk to you a little bit about public input where we want to hear from you. We have a survey that's, that's live right now. We want you to please take it. And we'll also talk to you about the upcoming activities. And then we're going to have a little bit of a question comment session. And we also have our uh, outreach and how you can kind of get um, get a hold of us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maggie. 
Thank you, Mike. So the seven corners visioning effort, which took place from 2012 to 2015, included a community task force that invited local residents, property and business owners, community and civic organizations, and others to participate in an open discussion about the future of Seven Corners. In 2014, a transportation study was completed for this visioning effort, which resulted in improvement recommendations from the task force. In 2015, Board of Supervisors adopted a comprehensive plan amendment for Seven Corners and approved 10 follow-on motions. In 2020, in response to follow-on motions number four and number six, Fairfax County Department of Transportation started a phasing study to help determine the order for those improvements and how they can be implemented to eventually help with applying for funding to construct those improvements. In the process of the comprehensive plan amendment, a charade, which is a meeting held to gather input and draw on maps, was held with the community and other stakeholders to identify the need for additional network connections and a multimodal improvements. From this meeting, six conceptual design alternatives were developed and shown to the task force. Three concepts were furthered for traffic analysis. Among these remaining three concepts, the ring road design was chosen as the preferred option because it best accommodated traffic operations and safety for vehicles, created a more direct and safer crossing for people and bike riders, supported the future bus rapid transit on Route 7, and allowed for the area to redevelop over time. The transportation improvement recommended in the comprehensive plan amendment adopted by the board in 2015 include a ring road from, from Hillwood Avenue that connects Route 7 to the intersection of Wilson Boulevard and the Roosevelt Boulevard crossing over Route 50. Reconfiguration of the existing interchange to a four-way intersection of, of Route 7 and uh, Wilson Boulevard and the Sleepy Hollow Road. Widening Route 50 from the Arlington Fairfax County line westward close to South Street. Shifted ramps that connect Route 50 to the new ring road on each side of the new intersection. Construction of a new road to connect the Wilson Multicultural Center and the Village Center to Route 7. Additional local streets to better connect the road network with redevelopment. These transportation improvements will provide and enhance multimodal facilities in seven corners. So the purpose of this phasing study is not to identify which transportation improvement we need because that was the outcome from the previous effort. The, the purpose is to determine the order for those improvements so they can be implemented, to consider interim conditions between improvements being constructed, to develop a concept designs, to assess property and the right of way deeds and the constructability, to develop a more robust cost estimates, using all this information to refine future fun funding application. I will be going over this in more detail in the next slides. There are four major steps in this phasing study process. The first one is the typical travel conditions. We will assess and evaluate multimodal travel conditions in the study area reflecting pre-pandemic conditions. We just recently completed the assessment. During tonight, tonight's meeting, we will be sharing the, the results of the analysis with you all and look for your feedback. So the next step is future conditions. We will develop and analyze two future year conditions. Year 2030 is the interim year with some of the improvements in place. Year 2045 is the ultimate horizon year with all or most of improvements constructed. We will define and evaluate improvement scenario 
in order to determine a logical and a feasible order for those transportation improvements. We will share the finding of the analysis at the next round of public meeting to be held late summer, early for 2021. At that meeting, we should have a good idea about uh, the order of those improvements, in particular, how the reconfiguration of the existing interchange and the railroad can be constructed. After receiving public and the stakeholder feedback and assessing property right of way needs, conceptual plans will be developed along with the cost estimate. The findings will be presented to the public in the third round of meetings in winter 2021-22. A key element for the phasing study is the multimodal analysis. This slide provides a quick overview of analysis. So for the pedestrians, the analysis assessed the pedestrian conditions in the study area. The focus is on the presence and the continuity of sidewalks, so the sidewalk gaps can be identified and filled. The measures include the pedestrian delay and the crossing time at key intersections and the interchange. For the bicycles, the analysis assessed the bicycle conditions in the study area. The assessment includes an inventory of the existing bicycle facilities, such as the bike lanes, which can be either shared or exclusive. And if it is shared, are there any shared name markings to help motorists and the cyclists safely share streets? Bicycle conditions were evaluated with the level of traffic stress, LTS. Basically, LTS measures how comfortable and safe it feels for someone to bike along a certain road. For vehicle travel, the analysis will focus on moving vehicle traffic efficiently and safely in the study area. As we all know how congested and busy this area can get, especially at the interchange location. The measures that we, we used to evaluate the traffic operations are delay level of service at the intersections, vehicle queue length at the intersections, corridor travel time, and the network throughput. So level of service is like a grading system to quantify traffic delay and the congestion. The delay experienced by the average vehicle can be directly related to a level of service. I will talk about the details using one example in a few slides. For the transit operations, the study area has pretty good transit coverage and a transit center. The analysis evaluated the transit conditions by considering bus routes, bus frequencies, bus stop facilities, and the bus ridership at the nine and the stop level. The map here shows the extent of the study area, which includes 21 synchronized intersections and the three unsynchronized intersections. The study area is multi-jurisdictional extends beyond the Seven Corners Community Business Center and into the city of Fort Church and Arlington County. A few study intersections are within the city of Fort Church and close to the Arlington County line. So typically when we, uh, when we conduct a traffic an analysis, we normally will evaluate the existing conditions in the original scope for this project, we were planning to collect traffic accounts in September 2020. As we all know, last year in March, we entered the pandemic situation. Due to the pandemic, travel patterns and the traffic volume have changed significantly. So we compared the traffic volume between 2019 and 2020 using street night data and the index data. Those analytical tools help understand what is happening on the roads using location-based services data from smartphones or real-time GPS data from most of connected vehicles and devices. So the comparison showed in a typical day in June, the traffic volume dropped about 20 to 50%. That's a significant reduction. So we decided to evaluate the conditions prior to the pandemic because 
that's, that represents more of a tra or typical tra traffic condition. So we used the previous uh, traffic data from Virginia Department of Transportation, Arlington County, and Fairfield County. We also have some older traffic counts. We used the streetlight data, index data, travel demand models to determine the traffic growth patterns in the past years to adjust those older counts to match with the more recent counts. So with this proposed volume development approach, we believe the current turning movement count can be reasonably estimated and used as the basis for the study. This slide shows the level of service, service and the traffic delay at the intersections and the extent of the maximum queues in the study area during the AM peak hour. Level of service is a quantitative measure that describes how intersections operate using the familiar school grade designation A through F. Level of service is based upon the average delay that vehicle, vehicles experience at a, a given intersection includes all movements. Just like school, level of service A is the best with uh, little or no delay. And the level of service F is the worst with a very high delay. However, different from school grading system, as we all know, we are trying to get A to in all the assignment and the test. For traffic, it's different. We have different perspective because we build the infrastructure and we are trying to maximize the usage of that. So we are striving for level service D or E for areas such as seven corners and also in some other areas in Northern Virginia. So Q lens is a measurement of the physical space vehicles will occupy while waiting in the line to proceed through the intersection. Typically, higher delay is associated with longer queues. So in this map, as you can see, the interchange and a couple of intersections on Route 7, they operate at a level of service E or worse. In other words, the average, the average time the vehicles need to wait at the intersection is about 55 seconds or longer. Nisberg Pike and the ramps connecting Route 50 experience long queues. So now we need to look at PM. So compared to the AM peak hour, the traffic operations in the PM peak hour shows a similar pattern, but with the increased average delay and the longer queue length at some locations. The additional intersection that operates at the level of service F, which is greater than 80 seconds of delay, is the intersection of Arlington Boulevard and the Patrick Henry Drive. The roads that experience extensive queues include Nisberg Pike, Wilson Boulevard, and the ramps connecting Route 50. So these two slides basically show the typical conditions for vehicle traffic. Now I will hand over to Mike to talk about the other transportation mode and the next step for this project. Mike? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Maggie. Um, so I wanted to just take a, t a quick pause right there. For anyone who joined us late, we have a Q&A feature in the bottom right of the corner. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, put them there. Again, we'll answer all questions at the end of the presentation. And then for anyone welcome, um, who also joined us late, we will be po this is being recorded live and we will post the presentation to the county's website um, at the conclusion. And we will answer all questions as, to the extent we can. Should we run out of time answering questions, we will gladly take them all and make sure that we answer them and post them all to the website. So with that, I'll give everyone just kind of a five second, kind of close your eyes, take a quick screen break for yourself, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So that's so just take a quick pause. And then from that, I'll go ahead and go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to talk to you now about is the pedestrian travel times, kind of pedestrian movement through the interchange. Um, in 2016 is when actually when, is when sidewalks were actually added to the interchange. So just a few years back, in addition to the sidewalks, they also added crosswalks and pedestrian signals, which are the flashing walk person or the, or the red hand that says do not walk. Before then, there was no real ability to actually cross through the interchange. Uh, there was a lot of uh, dirt, dirt paths and go paths that were created to try to help people get through. So the only way to kind of cross through the interchange was to actually either cross at the 
uh, pedestrian bridge over Route 50 just to the east, cross at Patrick Henry Drive also just to the east, or cross at this bridge right here just to the west of the interchange, and it only has a sidewalk on actually the west side of the bridge, and still there are no proper ADA or American Disabled Disabilities Accommodations Act accommodations at the ramp to get crosswalks to uh, and across the actual road. So that's what, so crossing the interchange was actually difficult. <clears throat> so what we're gonna showing you now is the typical travel times from our model that would actually take for someone to cross on the north side of the interchange. In this area, they're crossing from the new Grand Mart or the Italian restaurant crossing over the north side and then crossing over to the dealership to possibly get to the Eden Center. And what we're showing is based on our model times and, the, and what somebody would have to wait. It would take them approximately four minutes to cross in the morning or four minutes to cross in the afternoon. And that's a distance of about 300 feet. And conversely, on the south side to cross from Sleepy Hollow Road, crossing over Route 7 to cross to the mobile gas station and to maybe get to the transit center or to get to Home Depot or say the Giants that just opened up. That would take around four minutes in the morning and around five minutes in the afternoon, and that's a distance of only around 200 feet. To help you all put that in perspective, in the time it takes to cross the interchange, which is around four to five minutes, someone should be able to walk about 1,000 to 1,300 feet. The fact that they're only walking about one fifth of that distance shows you that while the interchange is walkable, it is actually not that quick or not that convenient. So what we're hoping to to do with this is to create a more direct and safe and even faster uh, crossing of the interchange through the ring road concept. So what I'm so what we're showing here is a transit service that exists in the Seven Corners area. Again, this is prior to the pandemic. What we're showing is around five lines and they all converge and, and all meet at the transit center, which you can see right here. We have headways roughly about every 20 to 30 minutes. And it's our intent to kind of keep the service roughly the same as we move forward and project out into the future. However, one additional service that we are adding is what is called, is called the bus rapid transit or, or BRT along Route 7. And that has been a study that has been led by the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission and VTC in conjunction with Arlington County, Fairfax County, City of Falls Church, and City of Alexandria for a line to run from the Mark Center in the City of Alexandria up to Tyson's in Fairfax County with a deviation over to the East Falls Church Metro Station along this along Roosevelt Boulevard in Arlington County. What we have kind of determined is that we have two, two, two years that we're looking at for this study. We're looking at an interim year, as Maggie noted earlier, around 2030, and an ultimate year around 2045. It is not our belief that we actually are going to have the BRT service up and running and operational by 2030. However, we are probably going to have some form of it operational by 2045. But as we go through this particular effort, if we're starting to build elements of the ring road and the BRT service does become viable, this ring road will still allow us to run the BRT service, even if we have to run it through the new four way intersection that Maggie talked about earlier, coming up Route 7, taking a right onto Wilson Boulevard and heading to heading down Roosevelt Boulevard. So we are being able to accommodate both existing transit and future transit with the ring road concept. So what I'm going to talk to you now about is the bicycle level of traffic stress. So just as we talked about, there's a way to measure car delayed in, at, at the interchange. Maggie talked about level of service. There's a way to look at and measure whether we have adequate sidewalk connections, which I showed you earlier with this with the interchange, as well as we have an ability to see if we have enough transit and service to um, help uh, accommodate and, and be there for the future populations. We also have a way of measuring bikes of, of bike conditions. So what we have here is an is called level of traffic stress or LTS for short, and it ranks from one all the way to four. On a on a condition that we show is one, generally this this type of facility is off road. It's wide enough to accommodate bikes in two directions, so generally around eight to ten feet wide. It is also buffered from traffic through either parked cars or a wide buffer that helps making make biking more easy and usable. And generally what we're looking for in this kind of bike environment is uh, we're looking to accommodate bicyclists age 8 to 80. That's kind of what we've generally used for that particular threshold. As we move down and we talk about an LTS or level of traffic stress to facility, this is kind of more thought about as a bike lane that you'd see on the road, but there is some buffer between the actual moving cars and the, and the bike lane, whether that be a stripe buffer as you see here, 
There could also be a on street parking. Or there could be a vertical or a kind of a, a median type buffer as well. Also, the traffic along the along the road is probably not traveling too fast and the volume seems to be rather not too much. As we move to a level of traffic stress 3 facility, this is something that you might see where we have a bike lane that is not buffered from the road. So it's right adjacent to the traveling cars and the speed of the cars might be a little bit faster, say around 20, say around 30 miles per hour. And you're going to have a little bit more car volume on there. As you move to an LTS 4 facility, this is where this is where the bike conditions don't feel that comfortable and where we really don't have a lot of people who feel confident or comfortable enough to actually bike on these facilities. To think about that, it's when we ask people to share the road with either a lot of cars that are traveling at a high rate of speed, or we have a bike lane that's again that's against the actual um, the traveling lane that's also with a lot of cars and a high rate of speed. So what does this mean for the seven corners area? Well, LTS 4 shows up as red and LTS 1 shows up as green. So what we can see here is that the interchange is actually considered a, a pretty big barrier to bike to bike to being able to bike comfortably in the seven corners area. In addition, route 7 shows up as having not, not very comfortable facilities and same with route 50 as well. So even though we added in even though sidewalks were added to the interchange back in 2016, they still aren't adequate enough to be able to comfortably allow for bikes, people to bike through here. A lot of the sidewalks that were added were still adjacent to the road with no buffer. That means they're called curb abutting uh, sidewalks. They are also not that wide. We're generally looking for wider sidewalks to be able to accommodate bike, bike users. Those are more what we consider utilitarian and maybe four, maybe five feet wide. So just enough for maybe one or two people to pass each other. So that's kind of what we're showing through here. So mo moving on, what we also looked at was a way to look at travel patterns through the actual interchange. And we kind of refer to this as the spaghetti diagram. You can see all the different movements that are trying to be accommodated through the interchange. And as everyone's aware, you've experienced the seven corners coming through here. So we're having to accommodate all these different movements and these are all crossing each other or basically these are major conflicts or, or converging points. What this graphic particularly shows is that in the morning, the heavy movement is from Arlington Boulevard eastbound to Wilson Boulevard eastbound. And that crosses over another heavy movement from Route 7 westbound, right here, going to the city of Falls Church and probably ultimately into Tyson's. So we have to be able to accommodate a lot of cars that are crossing over this converging point, as well as all the other points as well. That's why it's rather interesting to see when we go through this particular concept and what we're trying to do is allow these movements to occur without having so many conflict points. So by moving to an interchange or a ring road type concept, we in essence break a lot of the movements up so they all kind of happen on the outside, allowing for the inside four way four way intersection to be more comfortable for people to walk and bike through it. And now what I'm showing you here is the afternoon kind of travel conditions. Our bands are a little wider, which indicates we obviously have more travel. As Maggie showed earlier, we have uh, more travel, can, more people traveling in the afternoon through the interchange. Our big movements here are again Route 7 westbound through the interchange to the city of Falls Church and ultimately to Tyson's, as well as westbound along Wilson Boulevard going to westbound Route 50. What's also interesting to note is that we also have a heavy movement when eastbound Route 7 right here heading towards uh, heading towards Bailey's Crossroads, as well as east, eastbound on Hillwood Avenue, again, also heading towards uh, Bailey's Crossroads, where these two roads actually converge just before the interchange. And if you recall from the previous pedestrian graphic that I showed earlier, we also have a lot of people that it takes a long time to cross through the interchange through the interchange at this particular point. So when you have a lot of when you have two con heavy converging movements plus people wanting to cross and having to wait a long time, it actually creates a lot of conflicts and a lot of move and a lot of potential points for people to have safety issues and maybe accidents. So what we're trying to do is not only that is actually create a safer condition by having the all these movements kind of broken apart and allowing for the conflicts between vehicles, pedestrians and bicyclists to be minimized to the extent that we can. So what does this mean for us? So next steps. So the next thing we're going to do is look at our interim year and that's going to be our 2030. 
And we're going to look at all the typical. We're using the typical travel conditions that we have now. We're also wanting to hear from you. We want to know where you all see delay experience delay. And in addition, where you all want to walk or bike to, and even what roads you're kind of wanting to actually travel on as well. We're going to use that. We're going to use the forecasted volume. So use our models as well as use the multimodal because obviously we just showed you that the, the experiences of both the pedestrian. And the bicyclist and the transit user, and we're going to pull all that together and I, and try to work through identifying what the actual improvements might need to be for the interim condition. And so let me walk through that just for an example. So as an example, what we might consider is that if we build a portion of the ring road, say we build the ring road from Hillwood Avenue over Route 50, connecting to Sleepy Hollow and then to Route 7 first, so basically the west side of the interchange. And then as we continue forward into the next phasing, we want to build the next part of the interchange from Route 7 over Route 50, stopping just short, just on the other side of Route 50 on the north side, and allow us to build the ramps that connect into um, the Ring Road and Route 50 as a second phase, and then potentially connecting to Roosevelt Boulevard and Wilson Boulevard intersection as a final phase. So that just kind of shows you an example. That is in no way what we're going to what we might do. We want to again hear from you to determine how we how we can do this, as well as take into account all the conditions that we just talked about earlier. And then after that will be our next steps as we kind of get as we move to our third. This will be for our third and final public round meetings in the fall in the winter of next year. We're going to identify the 2040 scenarios as we as we work through to kind of figure out how our puzzle pieces will fit together. If you want to think about the fading study, another way to think about it is we're kind of building a building almost. We're putting blocks together, a foundation to help us get to the end stage, which is the end stage here is obviously the building of the ring road and associated other road network to realize the ultimate vision of the seven corners plan. But so we're going to go through that. We will do our multimodal travel analysis, which looks at again the pedestrians, the bicyclists, the transit users, and obviously the vehicles. We're going to look at the remaining order of improvements from 2030 to 2045. And then from there, we're going to we'll develop the preferred concept all the way from now to get to, to, to the whole um the whole enchilada, I feel like the whole thing, getting it all done. So we will put all the concepts together. And we, as with that, we'll develop a planning level cost estimate. And then we'll identify property impacts that go along with that. And then what we're also going to do is look at cost by phase of the project. One thing we want to be cognizant of is that if we're going to put some, if, if, if a particular phase is going to cost a lot, a particular, a lot of money, we want to make sure that we're getting the most, I guess, bang for the buck here. We're accommodating the most users being the bicyclists, the cars, the pedestrians, the transit users when we're doing a particular phase. So where are we now? Kind of what we've been doing for our outreach. We're currently in round one of our outreach. We have our English meeting tonight and we have our Spanish public meeting tomorrow night, but we've also uh, gone through all these different kind of groups to help advertise the meeting. Um, in the age of the pandemic, we did not feel it was comfortable or appropriate along with everyone else to try to have an in-person meeting or to really try to get out there and kind of meet with the community. So we felt this was the safest way possible and to try to make as much of this meeting, we re-engage as many people and as many uh, entities as we could. We also had an outreach video that accompanied this. Hopefully you all were able to see it. And again, as I've highlighted below, we have a survey that we that we want you to take. And so this is what we're, we're asking for the feedback. We're asking you to again, tell us where you experience traffic delays in the area. We have a list of intersections that we, we've highlighted for everyone so that you, and they've been shown before so you can kind of rank them for us. Um, are there, and then with that kind of, if you can expand upon it when you fill out the survey and tell us uh, what you see to be the particular tr um, trouble in terms of what movements might be dif difficult. So you're having difficult difficulty going through the in, in a particular intersection or you can't turn right or turn left is too long. That's kind of the information we're looking for. And to what destinations would you do you or would you like to walk or bike to? So we've kind of thrown a few examples out there like I want to walk to um, the uh, the Grand Martyr, I want to walk to Home Depot, I want to walk to the Transit Center. So we've kind of just thrown some examples out there to kind of get you all started. And then we also want to know what roads you'd actually want to kind of walk along. Um, if all you, if anyone has gone back and looked at Seven Corners plan, we have streetscape and other pedestrian and bicycle accommodations that we're also going to kind of be looking for in this particular effort. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we kind of coincide and make sure that we put the improvements in correctly. So here's our 
public outreach schedule uh, as it remains. So we're going to have pu the public meeting um, to talk about the 2030 conditions and kind of get set up for the 2045 scenario in late summer, early fall. And then from there, we're also going to from that, we're going to have our third meeting in the winter of 2021, where we'll show you all the building blocks that we put together to develop the preferred concept. And then after that, we'll go ahead and document the uh, everything from our study in the spring of 2022. But that does not mean we're done with it by any means. At this particular point, we've, we will have developed a, a good planning level cost estimates for each phase, and we'll be able to start applying for or reapplying for funding to make sure that we can try to get elements and pieces of the ring road built. We understand that a an improvement of this scale needs to be phased and put in over time. So that's why we're going through this particular effort. So with that, that is the conclusion of the presentation. Now we want to kind of turn it over to you to get questions and comments. Again, what you see here is all the information that we would that we have that you can kind of contact us. We have information on our project page. Our project manager, um, Nandita Paradkar, her her contact information is also below. And again, we have a link to our survey that we would definitely want to hear from you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Mike. Now we would like to open up the meeting for questions or comments. Please use the Q&A function to type your question for the moderators to, to read aloud. This feature is located in the bottom right of your screen. If you don't actually see Q&A, there's a button that has three dots on it. Press that and it should uh, provide you access to the Q&A box. Make sure that your questions go to all panelists when you do enter your questions. Again, we ask that you do not use the chat feature to comment or ask questions as someone may be joining by phone and we want to make sure uh, that everyone can equally participate and hear all of the questions. We will answer all submitted questions first before taking phone questions. If you are joining us by phone, please push star three to raise your hand to ask a question. When it is your turn, the moderator will call on you to ask your question. And after you are finished, please press star three to unraise your hand. If calling in and you are looking at the presentation on a computer, please move away from your computer to ask your question. After you have asked your question, the host will mute you and put you back in the queue so that we can get to all questions. Again, if you are calling in and you are looking at your presentation on a computer, please move away from your computer to ask your question in order to uh, eliminate more chance of interference and, and additional noise. And after you have asked your question, the host will mute you and put you back in the queue so that we can get to all questions. Depending on the amount of questions, we may not be able to address them all today. However, we will respond to all questions and all the questions and answers from today's presentation will be posted on the project website. So with that, I'm going to um, start providing the speakers with the questions. Are you planning these improvements in conjunction with the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission and the planned Route 7 BRT, which is scheduled for construction later this decade, parentheses close to 2030, question mark. That route requires some changes to the Route 7 roads, including the ring road. So this is Mike. I'll go ahead and take that one. So as we talked about in the transit slide, yes, we are planning the interchange, the ring road concept interchange improvement with the NVTC Route 7 BRT. Uh, again, we, as I talked about, we kind of are looking at two ways to accommodate. One is with an interim condition where it comes through the interchange. Um, you, hopefully we get the four way intersection built first, but the second part is if we only go build a certain part of the, um, of the actual interchange, then we want to be able to accommodate it again through the, through, um, through route 7 to Wilson Boulevard to Roosevelt, but ultimately with the ring road concept, we want to be able to accommodate the BRT service along that new Eastern leg of the ring road to connect to Roosevelt Boulevard, ultimately to East Falls church. So, yes, we are accommodating it. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Next question. Is this showing, and I believe this question was asked when you had some of the intersection and the networks maps up, is this showing just on the primary road or are delays from the crossing streets as well? 
speaking to the, I think maybe Maggie's cues, like the cue graphics and the level of service graphics. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'll take this one. Um, so basically, the so there's a multiple ways to uh, measure the delay for the intersection. We could look at the turning movements approach or average uh, intersection delay. Uh, however, the level of service is based on um, the average delay combining all movements. So yes, we not just look at the main street, uh, and we also inc uh, include the side streets delay as well. But if you want to look at uh, the the delay by movement separately, we have that information as well. Okay, thanks, Maggie. Next sure. question. Curious as to what is the role of VDOT in this phasing study process? I'll take that as a mic. So we have another group of of people that are actually looking at this particular study is called our stakeholders group. And from that, we have the city of Falls Church, Arlington County, as well as VDOT and several other uh, agencies within Fairfax County on board looking at that particular effort. So VDOT is an integral, integral role of this. They are going to be um, given all the, uh, they'll be able to provide their input and we're definitely going to work with them to make sure that this um, study moves forward. One thing I also wanna say is when we went through the comprehensive plan amendment, VDOT did have to weigh in on this and we actually asked for their kind of, basically a, approval of it to make sure that it was implementable. And we went through um, a lot of effort and they even coordinated with their central office to make sure that we, when we went through this and actually did a ring road concept that did not actually connect Route 50 directly with Route 7 anymore with direct ramps that we actually went through a, a ring road um, connection, a ramp system that that was still acceptable. And and they did deem that that was acceptable. So yes, they were they were with us in the when we did the plan amendment and they're continuing to be with us now and they will be with, with us through every step of this process to make sure that we have a project that they agree with and, and see that they can actually um, construct and approve with us. Okay, thank you, Mike. Next question. Would the Virginia Bicycle Safety Act impact your assessment if it is enacted? It would impact traffic if a car had to move over a whole lane to accommodate a bike within these interchanges. You know, I'm gonna say we're gonna have to look into that to tell you the truth. I, I'm not familiar with the act. One thing I will say though, is that we are trying to accommodate the bicyclists through the interchange in an off-road facility. So in theory, if the bikes are being accommodated there, then the vehicles should should not need to move over. If someone is riding in the lane, as is their prerogative, then I guess the act would be in effect, And but we do not have that um, evaluation taking place with this particular um, phasing study. So, Tom, this is uh, Tom Bashadney. Um, I, I am familiar with the act and uh, we are following its progress in the uh, Virginia General Assembly. Uh, as Mike indicated, um, we are looking to accommodate the um, bicyclists in a separated facility. And so, if we are able to do that successfully, um, there would probably be uh, much less need for bicyclists to be on the road uh, directly with cars. Um, so I do think that uh, the General Assembly hasn't passed the act and we need to see what happens with that. But um, I don't think that this, um, whether it passes or not, would be uh, result in a significant difference on the outcome of this study. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tom. Next question, will the multimodal travel analysis include detailed noise studies? This is Mike. Um, the answer is no, it will not have detailed noise studies. If we are looking to try to construct sound walls of some form, if that's kind of um, where this question is leading, that would have to be something that we would evaluate as we move further down the design of the interchange in which that would actually be come into effect. So uh, no, it is not looking at the actual noise levels. What we are looking at are the ability to accommodate 
all modes through the interchange and, and the best phase of the order of improvements to be able to put them in. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Next question, western side of the ring road that ends in a currently graded E traffic light at Castle. I've seen it graded as F before by FCDOT at Juniper Lane study. How does that not compound issues at the light? Can you read that one more time, Tom? Sure. Western side ring road that ends in a currently graded E traffic light at Castle. Parentheses, I've seen it graded as F before by FCDOT in the Juniper Lane study that has uh, was concluded a couple years ago. How does this, I assume he's asking the ring road, how does adding the ring road not compound issues at the light at trap, at, I'm sorry, Castle? So I'm assuming when he meant Western, he meant the East, I think we kind of refer to this as the eastern side, and this is the western side. So I'm going to go off of that. Uh, the Juniper Lane study again had different parameters in it. In addition, when we go through kind of a, a typical travel conditions analysis, or in this case, we're looking at a comp compilation of data, and I would we would need to go back and check which year um, you, the Juniper Lane study was looking at to make sure that we um, had everything correct. If it was looking at an out year, again, this is not showing the an out year. This is showing kind of the existing conditions. The ring road is kind of meant to help disperse traffic around the actual interchange. So in theory that the people who want to go on um, Route 50 would end up kind of coming this way, at least the ones that want to go eastbound on Route 50. So that would take that all those vehicles out of the interchange. People would be able to go through and then those who want to take left could also go this way through the interchange or if they like, they could go through the intersection and kind of again come back through the interchange so what we're in essence trying to do is help people find the path of least resistance and kind of allowing the traffic to kind of disperse a little bit which in theory would hopefully help the all the other movements through here as we go through the analysis we'll keep an eye on castle and and route seven and make sure that we have the proper improvements in in here to ensure that we're not exacerbating conditions um beyond what they should be. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Next question says, is the cost? I assume he means or she means, I'm sorry, he, Martin, means what is the cost? So that's kind of why we're going through this. We're, we're, we'll develop the cost in towards the later stages of the study. So look at this kind of as public meeting three, we will, we will have developed a cost estimate by phase, which will end up being a total cost for the interchange itself. Okay, next question. I live in Seven Oaks Drive. How will this affect the access road? I am concerned about additional traffic closer to our homes, as well as additional commuters using our cul-de-sac as a U-turn opportunity. All right, I'm gonna plead a little bit of ignorance. I am familiar, but I'm not familiar with all the communities in here. So Seven Oaks, if that person could just provide a little bit more. Um, oh, I see it, I'm sorry. Seven Oaks Drive. Right I got it, I'm, I apologize. Um, can you read the question one more time, Tom? Sure, he lives on Seven Oaks Drive and is wondering how this project will affect um, the access road. I am concerned about additional traffic closer to our homes, as well as the potential of additional commuters using their cul-de-sac as a U-turn opportunity. Okay, I'm, what I will say is that we'll have to take that into consideration, and this is why we wanted to kind of have this meeting so that we could hear all the concerns from everyone. In terms of that, people should really be using the ring road around this location. And the hope is by actually doing this, I know currently there are people that kind of come come through and cut through the kind of the Bank of America, which puts more traffic along this particular road to kind of get to Sleepy Hollow. When we kind of move to this kind of to this ring road interchange, it will actually be able to kind of set up a proper movement. So people who want to come through Sleepy Hollow will be able to continue up the ramp where they should be 
take a right on the ring road and continue down Sleepy Hollow for all those people who are destined to that location. But I, we will go ahead and take a look at that and make sure we provide a little bit more in depth answer when we actually respond um, in writing. Okay. Next question. To complete the ring road over Route 50 to Roosevelt, land acquisition would be needed. Would land acquisition be needed, or can it all be done with easements? So we would not build a um, an interchange like this, or even any sort of road on an easement. We would need to have the road in its own fee simple right of way. What we would try to do is work with the property owner. Um, if they ever came in for redevelopment, we would negotiate with them at that particular time to get the area for the ring road to be able to be built. If we are on, if they, that is not the case, and there is a time when we deem that it'd be appropriate, we would enter into a negotiation with the property owner and hopefully come to a mutual understanding of being able to acquire some of the land to build the ring road, leaving them with the remainder to be able to redevelop in the future. So that, that is kind of how we would do it. But when, one, no, we would not actually do this on easements, but two, we would work with the property owner to try to build the ring road to the extent we can using, um, mutual interest. Okay. Next question. Is the cost for the physical road work borne by VDOT? We are going to have to determine how that is going to be done. It, we, as part of the conclusion of this study, we will look to see all the funding opportunities that are available, both from the state, from the Northern Virginia Transportation Association, NVTA, as well as federal uh, opportunities that are available and even some local op, um, money that might be be put into the particular project. So I can, we cannot say that VDOT alone will bear all of this. I think it's going to be a um, an effort by many to be able to get this funded. Okay. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Can you please discuss impacts on Sleepy Hollow Road where I live? Do you expect increased traffic flow? If so, how much? Will there be speed control mitigation such as stop signs? And how does the sidewalk project tie in? So as we go through the analysis, we'll be able to determine the future volume that would want to use Sleepy Hollow. As part of that, we could also see, we could look into the speeds as well to see if they are too much. And if so, we could look at ways to reduce the speed. Um, as we are also having a, as I showed earlier, the pedestrians are definitely being accommodated through this uh, phasing study. So we have that, that's part of our multimodal conditions effort. We'll make sure that as any proposed sidewalks are put along Sleepy Hollow, that they connect into the existing sidewalks that are there today, or that we identify that there is a gap that needs to be um, closed through additional funding and, and building of improvements. But we will be able to answer that your question in more detail uh, through the next stages of this particular study. Okay. Next question. In order to have us, yes. Sorry. If I might just on that last question. So the the ring road that um, we've been discussing here this evening will be a multimodal facility. So it will have not only um, room for cars, but also for bikes and pedestrians. So I would envision that it would connect directly to the sidewalk improvements that are being um, implemented on Sweet Sleepy Hollow Road. So I just wanted to clarify that. Great. Thanks, Tom. Next question. In order to have successful bike transit, the bike lanes or access have to connect with a similar system. For example, if one gets through seven corners on Wilson without a connection on Wilson, the system is limited. Most cyclists would go through seven to commute. I can say that again. In order to have a successful bike transit, maybe your network, the bike lanes or access have to connect with similar systems. For example, if one gets through seven corners on Wilson, without a connection on Wilson, 
the system is limited. Most cyclists would go through seven to commute. Okay, I think I, I understand the question. We will work with our neighboring jurisdictions in Arlington County and the city of Falls Church to ensure that we kind of have facilities that can accommodate the bicyclists that are coming through there. As we, as again, as part of the stakeholders group, as we're talking with the city of Falls Church, it might be that they choose to not have the cyclists continue on Route 7, but instead maybe bring them down Hillwood to continue along the westerly route <clears throat> so that and then maybe find their way back up. So I think that's what we want, we want to do is work with our neighboring jurisdictions to make sure that we have like facilities or somewhat like facilities meeting up to ensure content, continuity of the network. And the same thing with Arlington County. We want to ensure that there's a continuity of the network along Wilson Boulevard. I, I do know that Arlington County recently just put in through a road diet, they put in bike lanes along Wilson Boulevard almost to um, Sorry, almost to McKinley Road. So I think what we'll need to do is figure out a way to make sure that we accommodate that same sort of the facilities along Wilson Boulevard in, this, in the county of Fairfax. Uh, so we will be having those discussions and making sure that the facilities are, are matched up to the extent we can. And we are using, we have draft plans that we've looked at as well, both from Arlington County and City of Falls Church to ensure that we kind of have facilities linking up. And furthermore, we actually have an active transportation uh, uh, effort that's going on right now, being led by our um, active transportation team, which is which looks at bicycle and pedestrian accommodations and facilities that they're going to look at kind of all the other facilities in the county to ensure that we have facilities that are matched up, that they make sense on a regional basis. So that is, so there's multiple efforts in which we're trying to make sure that our facilities are all coordinated. Okay. Next question. When will construction start? I cannot answer that. I can, I can tell you that it will not start tomorrow. It will need, it will be, um, dependent upon funding and making and ensuring that we find appropriate funding. Again, that's also why we've broken up the, the ring road concept in, into phases as well as the supporting infrastructure to ensure that we can try to build this as it comes along instead of waiting for all the money to build everything at once. We know that this is of a of an order and of a magnitude that we need to phase it in over time, which is also why we are trying to make sure that we find the appropriate improvements and build those first so that we are making sure to accommodate as many users as possible. Okay. The next question was answered by another member, another member of our team. So I'm just going to repeat the question and the answer so that everyone can uh, hear it. The question was, can we provide questions or ideas? after this seminar and the response was yes take our four question survey in either english or spanish on the project website let us know your ideas and concerns and the web address for the survey is https colon forward slash forward slash www.fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash transportation forward slash study forward slash seven hyphen corners and uh, please know that I will be giving that address again later, so if you didn't catch it, um, it will be given a couple more times later. So the next question, is the cost of the road work borne by VDOT? I believe we already answered that. All right, so next question. Does this phasing study incorporate any aspects of the Arlington Boulevard Trail? So we do have, we are looking at all aspects of the, of the multimodal connection. So the, the trail that is in the comprehensive plan, we do have that in here and that will be a component of the phasing study. Again, this phasing study is a multimodal evaluation. So we're looking at pedestrian, bicycle and vehicular and transit facilities. Uh, so yes, it will be part of it. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm saying a little too many Here we go. Next question. I want to walk safely 
two Seven Corners and businesses across Route 50 near, near Hampton Inn. I'm not sure where we're looking at. Okay, Hampton Inn is roughly around the north side of Route 50. Okay, this is more of a statement that we will take under consideration. Okay. Next question. How do you weigh delays for cars versus bicycles and pedestrians? Does vehicle traffic get prioritized? So what I will say is that we take vehicle traffic into consideration along with the facilities that we're putting in there for pedestrians and bicyclists. Yes, it does take it. it there is a lot of cars that are processed through here, but it is not the only thing that we're looking at. We're also look, that's why we're looking at pedestrian and bicycle facilities and transit as well. We're also looking at property kind of impacts as well as costs of the of the facility as well. So it is truly a full encompassing effort. Uh, I don't mean to beat around the bush. I, I we will take cars into consideration. This is a interchange that is rather terrible to to traverse through for vehicles. However, it's also believed that by solving kind of the vehicular conflicts, we will also be solving the, the pedestrian and bicycle conflicts as well, and also creating facilities that are better and able to be used by um, the pedestrians and bicyclists and even the transit users. Okay, next question. Are the planners aware of the pedestrian activity that comes from the creek near Brook Drive at Patrick Henry? There is a significant need for streetscapes, bike racks, pedestrian friendly improvements because many people walk alongside the creek. So that's a great comment and that's kind of that, that's some of the information we're looking for. Uh, while we are fairly um, knowledgeable of the area, we don't know everything and we need the people who live here and the people who experience it on a daily and very frequent basis to to help us with information that we don't always already know. So I believe you're talking about in the area that I'm highlighting or circling with the red highlighter right there, um, but that is information. So if you want to please take our survey and also submit that as kind of a comment and, and put a little bit more behind that. Um, we also have it here that, that that's much very much appreciated. So thank you. Okay, next question. Will the ring road over Route 50 eliminate the east-west turnaround available for people traveling on the Arlington Boulevard eastbound exit ramp. The Arlington Boulevard. You're going to have to step me through that just a little bit more there, Tom. Just, just so when, more time. We, when we convert to the ring road, um, will we be eliminating the Route 50 east to west turnaround? So you're going, I assume he means uh, if you're going eastbound on 50, right now you're able to exit, turn around, and go back to westbound Route 50. So, if you're exiting Route 50 in the future, and you say, and you and you inadvertently exited Route 50, and you want to turn back to go west on Route 50, you would come to the ring road at this particular point, take a left, and take a left, and then head back west on Route 50. In theory, actually, your turning movement when the ring road concept is, is implemented should actually be easier. Okay. Right. Next question. Is there currently computer controls for seven corners intersection whereby lights are controlled based on current traffic demand? And if not, is doing so feasible, feasible especially in the short term? So we do know that VDOT coordinates the signals and we will work with them. There are multiple controller cabinets that try to work through and, and work on a network to synchronize the, net, the signals as much as they can. And they take into account all the kind of the conditions that are out there. So the, generally during the morning and afternoon peak periods, they're kind of already set or pre-programmed because they already know how much traffic is moving through the area. At night, um, and when there's less demand, sometimes they are moved to more of a demand type sequence that allows them to kind of look through that. And I'm going to turn it over to Maggie to see if she has any additional information to provide. Uh, Mike, I think you're right in um, pointing those uh, out. So I just wanted to say 
the interchange signal is actually running in fully actu actuated mode, meaning it's responsive to demand directly. So, but we have not seen any controller that incorporates uh, pad demand, mostly it's, uh, it's for vehicle demand. Basically, each, each approach, there was there's loop de detectors to detect uh, what's the uh, amount of volume there, then uh, distribute uh, green time among, uh, within the signal. So it's actuated. So Mike, if I might add another um, aspect of that, you know, one of the challenges is that seven corners right now is so complicated that it is very difficult to come up with a signal plan that works for all the various intersections in seven corners. By implementing the proposal that we have here, it actually simplifies the intersection considerably, and it will be much easier to time um, all the signals in the area because it, it is going to be a much simpler in terms of the number of movements that each uh, intersection is handling. Okay, thank you, Mike, Maggie, and Tom. Next question. Have you been coordinating with VDOT's recent Route 50 STARS study in Fairfax and Arlington counties? We are aware of the study. It's a, it's a safety study. Um, this is a little bit different, but we we are coordinating and making sure that everything that would be done there is, is incorporated here. Okay. Next question, does this phasing study incorporate any aspects of, oh, that's a repeat question. Farouk, if you can mark that one completed. Uh, next question, looks like you skipped this question. Will the multimodal travel analysis include noise studies? We did answer the noise study question. I'll just answer it again since I think, we, so the answer is it will not include noise studies at this time when this project moves forward for engineering and design, they will do noise studies at that time and determine if any sort of sensitive receptors need any sort of additional sound mitigation. So at that particular point in time, it will be done. All right. Next question. Do you know why they didn't install a sidewalk on the island east side Wilson Boulevard when they did the bridge replacement. It's near the AAA office where there is no sidewalk last time I was there. And are there plans to install that sidewalk? So I cannot answer why it wasn't done. I do not believe there are plans at this time, but what we are looking for is for that kind of feedback. So we will make sure that that gets its way to our, our active transportation team to see if there's um, an ability to include it in future kind of planning or funding efforts. So, Mike, um, it's it's possible because it's too close to the intersection. That's why um, VDOT didn't want to install a crosswalk that they can synchronize. So we can definitely coordinate with VDOT on that. Great, thanks. Okay. VDOT does the actual designs and construction of the roads and installation of improvements. True? Yes, I mean, they do handle the design. These are two primary NHS National Highway Systems routes. But what they do do is work with the county to implement kind of the county's vision. So while we're going through this level of effort, we're going through the ability to kind of revamp redo the interchange to make it more simplified and more accommodating of all users, they will use this design as a basis to start from, and then they'll kind of modify and tweak as necessary when they go through the, the design and engineering phases of it. Okay. Next question, is vSIM or Synchro being used for this analysis? Yes. Yes, both of them are used in the existing condition and the future conditions analysis. Okay. Next question. By the way, the pedestrian lights are a great improvement. Thanks to whoever got that done. I guess that's more of a statement. Next question. Does the recommendation reduce the number of egress points 
between Route 50 and 7. Mm. I, I'm not quite sure. I fully. I think they're talking about the property access points um, around the interchange itself. One thing that we'll do when we when this concept is moved forward is they'll try to bring some of the or as many as they can of the access points up to standard. So if there are some that are too close and they can be closed and still provide access to another different access to the business or businesses, they will do that. So I would say that probably some of the redundant or too close access points will be looked at for possible closure to try to help improve the, con the traffic conditions. It also helps with the kind of the traveler's expectations of knowing when there are breaks in the actual sidewalk in terms of driveways so that they know kind of where to turn. It also helps with the pedestrians and the bicyclists as well by minimizing the number of conflict points over the pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Okay, thank you. Next question. In these scenarios, are you anticipating infringing on the properties of any existing businesses or are you trying to avoid that? We are trying to minimize to the greatest extent we can impacts to businesses. However, with improvements, there are probably impacts um, that we just can't avoid. And if that's the case, we will identify those. And as they move through to engineering and design, we'll see if those cannot be changed or modified slightly to avoid the businesses. And if they cannot, then we will identify those businesses and work with them to have a, to, to come to some mutual agreement. Okay, next question. When one drives in from Wilson Boulevard and turns left onto Leesburg Pike towards Bailey's, traffic coming in from the city of Falls Church often makes it difficult as they take up spaces. It would seem computer controls could help this, right? I'll, I'll take this one. So smart intersections can certainly help, but the general issue as uh, uh, our dir director pointed out is there are too many links coming to the same intersection, uh, making it almost impossible to provide a service to all approaches with a low delay. Smart intersections are helpful, but when there's uh, more volume than capacity, even they cannot handle queuing and the long delays. But maybe we can consider like do not block intersection, uh, intersection sign or something else. But basically with too many traffic, uh, too many links coming in, too many conflict points, there's a limit of benefits of smarter intersection. Thanks, Maggie. Next question, how will widening Route 50 affect the people who live on the south side of Arlington Boulevard immediately to the west of Seven Corners. For example, the Seven Oaks community is only accessible by Arlington Boulevard, the Arlington Boulevard access road by Aspen Road. So we'll look at that. It, from current just kind of plan view, it appears that there probably really may be sufficient room. But again, until we get into the next steps in the final phase of this, I do not want to say one way or the other, but we will try to use everything and everything we can to minimize any sort of impacts on residences for sure and, and you know businesses. So um, again, give us time to get that information as we progress through the study and we'll be able to answer that question in better detail later. Okay, thanks, Matt. Next question, can you do license plate reading and correlation to say zip codes with DMV to better understand current patterns from large data sets? Um, are they trying to get the origin and destination information? Yeah, aren't we already doing that with Streetlight? Um, I think so. Yeah, street night uh, is uh, normally commonly and widely used to obtain that kind of information because it's already collecting the the, the license based uh, you know um, the service data and um, the real time data. So yeah, we we have many ways to um, obtain that kind of information. 
and I'll just point out that we are obtaining that particular information with this study. We have developed an origin destination kind of matrix through here so that we could understand where trips are coming from and going through through the study area to kind of help us better with the improvements to make sure that if we're putting a particular improvement in place that we are best accommodating the um, traffic that wants to be there. And, and this is Tom. Um, Maggie's right there. There are some new tools like the streetlight data that can help us to um, determine that origin and destination. But um, we also did a, um, a video uh, from a helicopter of this intersection a few years ago so that we could see how cars are progressing through the intersection, um, which movements they were making. So we do have a number of tools that we can bring to the table for this analysis. Okay, great, thanks, Tom. Next question, is the ring a raised road or surface? It is a combination. So it, it goes above Route 50 on both the east and west side. And then it's at surface when you get from the southern part of Route 50 crossing over Sleepy Hollow over Route 7. Um, again, how it's treated here is probably not at grade or on the surface, probably a, a more of a bridge. And then how it gets over here, we have yet to be determined. But around this point, again, it'll probably it'll be at at grade. So I hope that kind of so it's a combination to answer the question. Okay. Next question: Why are the planning horizons so far out, thirty and forty-five years? Are there interim bicycle and pedestrian improvements planned for the short, short term, say two to five years? Let me answer the long term question first. So a, an effort like this that has to go through identifying the phases in which we're going to build it, making sure that we're getting the correct phases in place, ensuring that we're accommodating all the modes through there and then also applying for the funds and then going through at the same time going through design and engineering of it and then going through construction it takes some time to to go through all these particular phases the, these massive these bigger projects do take some time hence the longer term of the the longer term horizon of the study in addition we did recognize the expense that was possibly going to be incurred with this type of improvement and doing that also necess necessitated kind of the, the movement of the horizon year out to ensure that we are uh, going through and finding the and, and planning for it appropriately and that's kind of why we've taken the phasing approach because we knew that it was going to be too much to try to build too soon it would be too costly we would never be able to get it funded so breaking a project like this into pieces allows us to kind of accomplish the um, the greater good um, in, in segments so and then yep yeah. I was just going to add that um there might be some confusion we're not looking 30 and 45 years out we're looking at 2030 which is 10 years out and 2045, which is 25 years out. Yes, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. And the shorter term ped bike facilities, we, again, we have we have an active transportation team that, that's looking at that and we can see what we can also, we have a transportation priority um, program that we put together. So looking through those particular efforts, we can see what other, um, what's in those to be funded as well. And then we take any other efforts that are that kind of come through and, and add them to our plan um, should when the time arises. So um, we're, we're actively looking for anything that's that's there and, and trying to identify improvements as they kind of go through. But for this particular effort, yes, we are looking at it. It is a longer term study uh, <clears throat> that we're looking at. So, so this is Tom. I just wanted to clarify. Well, the study is a longer term study, so we can look at how all of these improvements might be implemented and what are the, the as Mike previously said, what are the biggest bang for the buck? Um, I don't, we don't anticipate that it'll be 30 years before any of the improvements will be completed. Um, those are really the horizons that we use for the study effort, but we do anticipate that we will be able to do improvements before that. Um, whether it is in the two to five year range, that remains to be seen, but um, it, it is not going to be 30 years before we do some improvements. Thanks, Mike and Tom. Next question looks like a, 
a repeat of a prior one? Will parts of the ring be raised or is this project all surface? Mike already answered that. Next question. Can we access Route 50 East from Aspen Road? Always a traffic jam there. I think um, Route 50, you'll have to, the way it looks, you'll have to get on the ramp um, or you might be able to pull off beforehand. I think what we'll be able to do is as we go through this particular study, we'll be able to look at the ramps and kind of make sure that they are appropriately sized and ensure that we can kind of do that. But no, I don't see that the intersection of Aspen Road as an intersection Route 50 is going to be changed at this time. But again, let us go through the study and kind of see if any modifications might be needed at that particular point. Okay, thank you. Next question, will traffic on the Western Ring Road be one-way traffic? The answer is no. Traffic along both along the whole ring road is meant to be two ways, so you should be able to go counterclockwise and clockwise on the ring road. Great. Next question: Why are the planning horizons so far out? We already answered that one. A little glitchy tonight. Okay. Is further development on the seven corner in the seven corners area, including Old Sears and Williston's Williston Center, dependent on completion of this project? The answer is no. Uh, if anything were to help be constructed there, maybe there could be some monetary assistance they could provide, but I don't think that would be asked for. I, when usually when redevelopment occurs. We ask them to build the improvement roads that are in the vicinity of the project. So that's kind of how, because, and also this particular interchange concept is going to take a public investment. So we're really going to have to rely on the, the public to do it. But again, through redevelopment, we actually would realize and kind of implement the other supportive roads that you see here in yellow and, and possibly in orange to be able to support that redevelopment. Okay. Next question is another repeat. Will traffic on the Western Ring Road be one way traffic? Um, are, are any businesses directly impacted by right of way? If so, which are these that would be impacted? Well, the answer is probably, possibly, but again, we don't know till we get further into the study. So I, I cannot say yes or no until we are sometime from a year from now, when we get into the, when we identify the prop, the property impacts. Okay. Do you anticipate a future bus route on Sleepy Hollow Road? I personally would say that we would need to look at the transit development plan to see if there's any sort of demand for a bus route or for or any kind of planning for a bus route on long sleepy hollow road um, just because there isn't one in our long range transit plan doesn't mean there couldn't be one in the future okay is future development sears and wilston that's already been answered at least one new bridge is needed but would the existing bridge be refurbished or rebuilt? So I'm not quite sure which bridge you're talking about. I think maybe you're talking about crossing of Route 50. So let me just kind of walk through it. This bridge right here that exists today would probably have to be rebuilt. Um, it's, it's not quite uh, wide enough to be able to accommodate the bike and pedestrian uh, users as we want, as we would envision in the plan. This one over here would be new, and then there would be some modifications, obviously, to the interchange and all the, and the, and the bridges that are in here. Um, and then this one as well would have to be dealt with, not dealt with, but it would be realized through kind of redevelopment of the Wilston area and the Seven Corners Shopping Center. How contingent are the plans on redevelopment of seven corners more generally, do you need landowners to contribute land for these upgrades? We need landowners to contribute land for the 
network improvements that are in the area in which they would wish to redevelop. So in kind of the Wilson area, um, again, over by the target area, and then as well as the shopping center. In terms of what's needed in the interchange area itself, I think we would just have to go through this study and figure out what additional property might be needed to realize the interchange, the, the ring road concept um, as it as in both in the 2030 and then in the 2045 year. Okay. That at this point is our last written question in the Q&A box. And a quick scan of the attendee list. I do not see anyone with their rate with their hand raised. Remember, if you are on the phone and you would like to ask a question, press star three. That will raise your hand and we will be able to call on you to verbally ask your question. And if there's anyone that wants to put any more questions in the Q&A box, please feel free. Give another minute or so, see if anyone else is interested. A uh, new question in the Q&A box, is the ring road single or double lanes each way? So we're going to look at that, but I do not I do not believe that a single lane in each direction of ring road probably is going to accommodate the demand that needs to be here. If, if you can think about the demand that already comes into this, into the heart of the interchange where the seven roads meet, then that's probably not a single lane in each direction is probably not going to be feasible. We did look at some of the number of lanes that would be needed as part of the seven corners comprehensive plan amendment. But again, we're taking a look at that again this time and seeing what is the number of lanes that should be um, on that particular ring road in the future. Okay. Um, do you anticipate a bus line on Sleepy Hollow Road? You've already answered that one. Going back to the attendee list. Still not seeing anyone with a hand raised. Uh, Farouk, can, can you confirm? Are you seeing anyone? I do not see any either. Oh, okay. New question. Uh, is the design dependent on the widening of 50 or could the ring road occur with the current capacity on 50? So that's going to be part of what we're look, what we're evaluating. The, cur the current comprehensive plan calls for Route 50 to have six lanes from the Arlington County line to the west. What we are going to try to determine is if the six lanes has to continue under the interchange today or if it can stay as four lanes um, or if we need or if we need that so i think what we're looking at is a combination but what we're seeing is that probably is that route 50 on our current comprehensive plan is fifth is should be six lanes and it's in if you look at the demand that was on route 50 prior to the pandemic you could see that a lot of the road was completely saturated and a a major route such as this that runs parallel to I-66 and parallel to Route 29 and even parallel to 236 and Columbia Pike probably should have um, and should have that kind of lane uh, number of lanes. But again, we're, we're looking at kind of how how it the, the actual Route 50 itself under the interchange itself. But we're currently planning for and, and trying to accommodate six lanes. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, we have reached the end of our time for the meeting. I didn't realize it had passed 8.30. Lots of good questions. Thanks to, um, thanks to everyone. Um, we have reached the end of the meeting. As a reminder, the questions that we did not get to tonight, if there are any others that, that come in, will be posted online at www.fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash transportation forward slash study, forward slash seven hyphen corners, along with a recording of tonight's meeting. If you didn't get a chance to provide feedback this evening or would prefer to submit feedback online, please visit that same website. 
and fill out the feedback form or take our online survey. Feedback will be accepted through February 26, 2021. You can also reach us by phone at 703-877-5600. And finally, you can mail comments if you wish to Fairfax County Department of Transportation, 4050 Legato Road, Suite 400, Fairfax, Virginia, 22033. Thank you again for your participation.